Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Laura Hansen with Connect My Brain. So glad that you are with me today. This is going to be the end of a series where I've really focused on neurofeedback and very specific diagnoses so that you could get a little bit more detail, hopefully understand a little bit more about neurofeedback. Neurofeedback has really become quite a passion for me because I have just seen amazing changes when you incorporate the brain. When I got started in neurofeedback in 2008, my very first system was focused on simply measuring a stress response test. And I did that because I really work a lot with primitive reflexes, integration of those reflexes through a therapeutic model, but it was so difficult to help either mainly parents, but sometimes even adults, how this reflex was still firing because they didn't have the same background as me. And so they couldn't appreciate the, the, the reaction or the startling of the body. And I really wanted something to quantify what that reflex was actually doing in the neurology. And one of the things that it does is it is the initiation of the sympathetic nervous system of what we know as fight or flight. And I, I mention this system probably almost every podcast because it is the physiological reaction that goes on in our bodies. And I think we've kind of gotten to the place where we just kind of go, I'm so stressed out. And we don't realize that there really is a physiological event going on that if it stays chronic, it is going to take over real estate in the brain. And even when we're going to talk today about traumatic brain injury and trauma and memory, even in those situations, there's a physiological reaction that's going on, and that is the stress response. So we're able to actually measure this. And from years of working just this particular model, quantifying a chronic stress pattern, that is where so much insight came to me about this idea of the patterning that can go on in the brain. And when we use the word chronic, sometimes I think we, we only believe that it could be years that this is going on, and, and it's not. It can be a short period of time. It can be the repetition of the same kind of insult that keeps this brain firing in a particular way and ultimately leading to a bath of inflammatory biomarkers in our brain that can really have a substantial impact on the quality quality of your life, your ability to remember, whether it's long-term or short-term, your drive, your motivation. So even though we've been talking about diagnoses like anxiety, depression, insomnia, everything that's going on with an individual also has some specific physiological events that are going to happen in every single one of those situations. And so when we're able to look at that and be able to validate what we're going through, I think it makes a huge difference. But this is where I really got started and really began to appreciate this idea of patterning and what's going on in the brain, especially if there is a diagnosis, but also if there is some uh, historical event like a traumatic brain injury. And that's, that's where I want to start with us today is on what's known as a traumatic brain injury, also known as a TBI. And there are three different grades to a head injury. Number one is going to be a concussion which results in a short period of confusion, typically lasting for about 15 minutes. Then we have a grade two concussion that results in amnesia directly related 
to confusion without loss of consciousness lasting more than 15 minutes. And then we've got a grade three loss of consciousness with post-traumatic amnesia that lasts for one to 24 hours. So we even have these medical classifications for looking at a head injury. So there is a severity that is looked at. There's also something called the Glasgow Coma Scale, which evaluates where this person is very quickly among first responders. And it goes from three to 15. 15 is going to mean a mild traumatic brain injury, and a three will mean brain death or loss of brain function. So there's many different classifications out there that are speaking directly to what kind of a head injury somebody has taken. Something that I think is very important, especially for any parents listening, and their child is participating in contact sports. And this is certainly not uh, only related to football, it's soccer, it, it can be baseball, it can be basketball, it can be anything where your child is moving about with other people and something can happen and they take a bump on the head. And I don't want any parent to ever take that lightly. I think today we're in a much better place of realizing the impact of these mild head injuries, but I'm not sure that we understand the long-term impact that can happen from repetitive hits on the head. Um, I currently am taking care of two little boys that are twins that are five now. And when they were little, they literally fell off of a cliff while driving one of those little motorized uh, cars. And there has been a cascade of situations that have gone on for them that we would still put um, the classification of a traumatic brain injury and trying to restore brain function, especially that they have so many open windows of development ahead of them. And I, when I speak about development, I'm really going to dive into that, especially when we're talking about trauma, because if we're talking about someone that is three years old and goes through this kind of an injury, their brain is not fully functioning yet. There are still so many windows of development that we really don't know how far reaching the impact of an injury can have on a developing brain as those new systems and networks are coming together. So sometimes I think it could be even a greater clinical picture for an impact like that when a child is not all the way up to maturity. On the other end, when somebody is fully developed or you know, in, in the in the height of really getting their frontal lobe online, which goes from puberty to your early 20s, but they've already mastered all of the primal developmental sequences, and now they're champion athlete, or maybe it's a car accident, and some of the treatments that we have in place, especially after the acute situation is not matching how far they had already developed and they're being retrained on a suboptimal level. So when we're in an acute phase, let's say it's a severe traumatic brain injury. And of course, there's going to be a stage of time that the individual literally has to go back and retrain. That's true for heart attacks and strokes and things like that as well. And this is where understanding 
reflexes is so valuable because reflexes, while they do integrate, they don't disappear. They are there in the brainstem for such a time that you've got to go back and be retrained. So we will call that the acute phase of care. Once we have re-entered into a level of function, we now need to get that brain back online at the level that it was prior to whatever the injury was, motor vehicle accident, contact sports, an accidental fall, whatever the case may be. I think we brush this stuff off too lightly. Um, I'm, I'm working with a little boy and the grandmother brought him in the other day and she she's taken a fall and has a magnificent bruise on her face. This face is part of your cranial vault. And even in that situation, we're, we're sometimes just, if we feel okay, then we're automatically brushing it off and we don't understand what's really gone on even in a mild situation. They estimate that even under 30 miles per hour, coming to a very uh, abrasive, acute halt is going to cause a acceleration first, you're moving, and then a deceleration on the impact of the brain. And while the skull is a bone and it is meant to be your shell and protect you, it is not designed to withstand forces beyond its capacity. And when you hit, that impact can be so abrupt that literally the brain is going to slam back into itself on the other side. So these are vectors. And one of the very interesting things that is available with the equipment that I have, I don't have this particular part of the software. I'd really like to have it. But with the S Loretta, you can actually go in and pinpoint those vectors of insult and really identify exactly what area of the brain has been insulted the most. Now, with the equipment that we have, we absolutely can see so many things. And so I don't want to make it sound like I can't identify that, but this is something that I continue to do is add and upgrade because there is so much wonderful information available that will only make me a better clinician and offer, you know, gold standard, top of the line services and management plans to my patients. And that's always the way that I want to practice. But being able to identify exactly in a 3D picture allows to me, the individual, to also be able to see and appreciate how we can identify a specific region in the brain that neurofeedback can be an optimal therapy in order to get that person back online. And I've also, I've had a lot of experience with people coming in with TBI. And sometimes I think in an early stage of a TBI, any parent would be very afraid and they're going to typically follow exactly what needs to be done and is being referred by a traditional medical approach. Now in the acute phase, absolutely. But once that person is released, I am going to encourage you to go after everything and know that this brain has the ability to be rewired. 
And I, I had another experience where it led me to actually speak to the neurologist, his uh, PA. And one of the things that she asked me was, how do you know to do all these therapies? And my response was actually, how do you not know? You're a neurologist PA. And there are so many wonderful therapies out there. And I, I do think that this part of our community that has suffered TBIs have almost identified themselves with the TBI and they're not moving forward. And we need, we need to move them forward, regardless of your age, regardless of how many years you've been going through, whatever you're going through, you can make a difference by utilizing other therapies, okay? Neurofeedback is definitely one of them. We do a brain map. We can identify what areas of the brain are out of power or not within the correct range. So for example, if we're looking at delta and theta, delta and theta are slow waves. And in TBI, there is a high predisposition to having an increase in slow waves because the brain has been injured. Now in, in a situation, I'm gonna say under two years, that brain is actually still in what I'm gonna call a subacute stage. And it may still appear with a lot of slowing. I think that there's a lot of information out there that uh, directs us to know as clinicians, we got a two year optimal window right after that insult to make the greatest changes. Now, again, I still believe if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and go to work, I believe you can make great changes at any time. But some of the cases that I had were um, really, they, they struggled. They struggled not with the neurofeedback and, and the biofeedback, but the greatest problem I see, regardless if I'm talking about traumatic brain injury or even developmental delay, is the, the attachment to food. And in a traumatic brain injury, if you ever needed to think about your diet, it is after an injury. And even these subacute ones where maybe your, your son is playing football and he's been hit in the head three times, and maybe it's still a grade one under 15 minutes. However, that is a repetitive injury. And just like any other injury, there is going to be a change in function. There's going to be an inflammatory reaction, and that is part of how we handle any kind of injury. That's a physiological event. And we have to look at how do we put the body in the best position in order to heal correctly. And so our fuel is so important. When you have a brain injury, there is an increase in the glutamate neurotransmitter, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. If this transmitter continues to flow like a fire hydrant, which it would with a diet that is creating a lot of inflammation. So you can have the layer of the injury and then the insult of the food. That can literally change the quality of healing down at a neuron level. Because what they have found is that glutamate is actually going to eat the myelin right off of that nerve. And the myelin is your conductive sheath, which is going to be part of white matter of the brain, which is how we get information from one part of the brain to the other. So it is absolutely imperative that if you have had an injury, that that would have to be part of your healing process. You know, even in a diagnosis of cancer, 
many people who choose to go in a more holistic manner are, are taught that we have got to create a pH of alkalinity in the body because cancer cells are typically under higher proliferation in an acidic environment. And this is where people changing their diet, changing the chemistry of the body are literally promoting health. So as cells turn over, there's a new role model to follow. And that role model is a stronger, healthier cell. The same thing is true in a traumatic brain injury. You've got to be willing to look at functional labs. You've got to be willing to change diet. You've got to be willing to take supplements where there's deficiencies. I believe in labs because I am no longer guessing. I am looking at that lab and that lab is telling me what is going on in the chemistry of the person. And we are able to handle those different layers so that we can restore cellular function, healthy cellular turnover, and begin to get that brain fog to dissipate while you're doing therapies such as neurofeedback. We also have other therapies in our office. One is called a neurosensory integrator board. And this is literally where you go and you practice eye movements and memory uh, exercises so that the things that you're struggling with, lots of times that's what people struggle with, with head injury is memory issues and eye movements. Remember, eyes are an extension of your brain. It's the part of your brain that's on the outside of that skull. The reason I say that, that is the only aperture of the body that we can literally take a scope to and go in without any invasion in the body and look at a nerve. That's an extension of your brain. So we, we look at eye movements. We, we look at, you know, what are the things that you're struggling with? And we put that package together. When you approach your brain in this manner, especially following a traumatic event. And it could be mild or severe. It could be one time or it could be repetitive. You will change your outcomes. And the ones that don't, and I've seen it, the ones that won't address the food, the ones that won't that take that extra step and do some extra therapies, they are not changing quite the way the individuals are that are going through this event and have a nonstop courage and strength attitude to get their lives back. If you had yourself together prior to an event, you can get it back. Some of the things that I want you to look for, especially in our youth who are in contact sports, who may have had several little, what we'll call just bumps on the head. This can really change mood. It can cause aggressive behavior. It can cause a heightened state of anxiety and irritability. It can cause loss of memory. This can cause a lack of drive, and this can cause a lack of being able to sleep properly. This is why it's so important that we get a detailed history on every single patient so that we know what you've been through. You may minimize something where it might be the very thing that has caused you to be in the situation that you're in today. I've looked at histories with so many interesting pieces. I'm working with a man right now, 42 years old. He was a conehead at birth and lived on Diet Coke growing up. That is aspartame or artificial sweeteners, which we know now 
There is plenty of evidence eats the myelin off of the nerves. He is going through neurodegenerative dementia at 42 years old. Your past can absolutely cause insult to your brain. Understanding how development occurs is imperative in looking at that entire picture of each and every individual. That's going to segue me into trauma. Trauma is another area that, especially over the last 26 years of practice, I have certainly had many people share many things with me. And I would say it is probably 90% of the people that I have seen over 26 years that have some type of traumatic experience, even on a subconscious level. And one of the things, even from a spiritual point of view, it is important to even look at when we are planning to have a baby, because whatever you're going through at the time that you conceive your baby is highly influential in the outcome of the emotional well-being of that baby. You can even go on YouTube today and you can type in lights revealed at conception. There is a magnificent light that is illuminated in the womb of every woman at the time of conception. Life begins at conception. There isn't one part of conception that isn't needed to allow that life to go to the next stage. You can't jump into baby form without first being the egg and the sperm coming together. That is the beginning. And each and every stage is part of the knitting of that individual. And what a mother or couple may be going through, even during the pregnancy, is highly influential on the well-being of that baby. Principally because of the reflexes that are going on. And I will do a series on reflexes so that we can get into the depths of that. But there are sequence of events with these reflexes. The first one is the withdrawn, where each and every one of us are learning how to handle a threat for when we get out here into the world. I can even go up to an adult if they are really pulling back into that brainstem, as I mentioned earlier, this is the place of all rudimentary learning. And when you come into this world, you are formed, but you are dominant in your brainstem. And if you are not easy in this world, which could have started back then, or maybe it's an event that happened as a teenager or an adult, it's your history. It's what you went through. But we have a set of reflexes that literally wired us to always protect ourselves and know how to get away from danger. Then we merge into the primitive reflexes. And the first one, Moro, I, I've, I've mentioned Moro so many times. This is arousal. This is CO2, O2 reflex. This is the sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight. And if that relationship or experience in the womb was perceiving a threat even before it ever got here, we are really heightening up that fight or flight response. And when you come into the world, you are in a heightened fight or flight because this is a new experience and you are supposed to be responding to all of these new things coming in. But if they are threatening, that is what is being laid down. If you go through a physical trauma, as I mentioned, with these little guys, you, you had an insult 
at such an incredible time when things were coming online. And if this was not eliminated ASAP, that is becoming part of the hardwired system. You are building your subconscious from pregnancy. Sometimes I, I say last trimester, you know, I, I always like to have something with a reference. So there's definitely a reference that says from the last trimester, but I know my limitations of what I can actually know a hundred percent because one, I'm not God. And there are so many things that there is just no way we can actually determine them. I don't care how much science you lay on top of them. But I am a doctor, I'm a clinician, and I, I, I do like to be able to validate where I'm coming from. And it also teaches me. But whatever goes on in that womb up until about seven and a half, eight and a half years old is shaping your subconscious mind. And that is going to be 95% of brain function. It's only the conscious mind that is 5%. That's why in neurofeedback, we have you watch something so that we could entertain that 5% and allow the subconscious, the 95%, allow that brain to do the work that's actually going on in brain training. And that's what neurofeedback is. It is brain training. I remember uh, a mom that I had met probably a year and a half ago, and she came in for a brain map because of her anxiety. And as we sat there and went through the findings, looking at the report, she was, she was just weeping. And I looked at her and I said, are, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? And she said, this is why my little boy has anxiety. It's because he's learning it from me. And she's a hundred percent right. And look, even myself, all of us as, parent, as parents have influenced and affected our children. There is no doubt about it. But we're learning more today than ever before. And we can put this information to practice. And putting that information to practice is taking the information that you're, that you're learning and applying it. So if, if you have gone through trauma, let's, let's get you going in the other direction. We are not meant to go through this life hanging on to the past. And the past became a very hardwired belief system during a very early part of our development. And in order to change that, we need to see what, how it has influenced your brain. Look at where the frequencies are out of range. What's so interesting about one of the reports that is generated from the program that I use, Brain Master, is it will have on the other, on one side of the page, the symptoms that are associated with when we find this particular region out of range. Now, it doesn't mean you would have all of them, but what I ask people to do is to highlight the ones that they are seeing either in themselves or in their children so that they have a very solid connection that what we're doing here at Connect My Brain is we are working on the brain and you can watch how these symptoms are going to change over time. Plus, we are going to incorporate with that awareness daily strategies that you or your child can do in order to move in another direction. In my last podcast, I talked about a lot of these issues, anxiety, depression, insomnia, even attention issues are now practiced patterns. Never to 
make anybody feel like they haven't done enough or that or, or minimizing how you're feeling. Please, please, please never take it that way. I am on the side of connecting your brain and changing pattern. I am not a counselor. I'm not a psychiatrist. My job is to connect the dots. You can use any other therapy while you are doing neurofeedback. And in fact, neurofeedback will make medications work better. It will allow you to take in any kind of counseling tip and begin to apply it and know and know what it means if you are actually achieving what's being recommended to you. You see, that's how the brain changes. It changes in real time and when it gets feedback. And that's what neurofeedback is. The interesting part about neurofeedback also is you can do other things besides just sitting there watching something. Sometimes people want to read. Sometimes people want to journal. Sometimes people want to do do nothing, hug a bear. We've got a, a great bear that literally is going to vibrate while you're holding it every time your brain is in the right place. So there's many tools associated with neurofeedback. But the idea is if we can connect the dots and understand that the way that we're feeling, regardless if it is an emotional thing like depression, uh, a lack of drive, sadness, or it is my memory is, is just not, is not working for me right now. My child is having trouble paying attention. Maybe as an adult, you're having trouble paying attention. Maybe it is that you can't do math equations like you used to. Maybe it is even dyslexia where the brain organization is not communicating at an optimal level. Whatever the symptom is, to be able to connect that dot and see that the pattern that you're going through is actually being validated by your brain map, I think that that would bring about tremendous peace and that there would be an opportunity for you to be able to do something that's going to allow you to change your brain. It is so unfortunate. So many people are so broken right now. And I'm really reaching out. And if this is you, or if you could share this with somebody, the idea is we want to bring about hope. This is an incredible therapy that is bringing about amazing changes. Now, it is not a standalone therapy, and I always want to emphasize that. It is meant to work in conjunction with whatever else we need to do. Here at Connect My Brain, we have a three-tier approach, mechanical, chemical brain. We want to look at what that body is doing. Before that brain got wired up, that's all you did is you moved. So we want to see what, what's the movement like. Even if it's a child, it's about how they got wired up. If it's an adult and you're not doing anything physical, your body is becoming less flexible. And a less flexible body is a less flexible brain. Chemistry, we want to see, are you in an inflammatory storm? You're not going to heal if you are. Are you deficient? Is there something going on like dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in bacteria, or SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? We can, we can change all of that. Do you have a mutation on MTHFR? That's a hot topic, and it's a gene, and it's our methylation pathway. It can be supported, and you can move forward. And then it's the brain. We do a brain map 
and we look to see where those areas need to come back together. We allow them to practice so the timing is restored. The power is restored. You are restored. You are feeling more organized. Your child is functioning at a higher organizational level, turning in their homework. You're, you're thinking, you're, you're sequencing the way that the human brain is designed to do. If you are this individual or you know of somebody, reach out. You're always welcome to call the office. Our number here is 678-501-5172. The website is connectmybrain.com. Check out our show notes and our e-school. The Connect Journal is a fabulous tool if you just want to dip your toe in. Make sure you subscribe and share this podcast. Our goal is to get information to the world so that people know that they can change their brain at any time. Always want to reach out to my podcast manager, Marcy Page. She has given me a tool that has allowed me to really show my passion for caring for people. I hope you have a great day.